there's no secret formula for scaling support and boosting customer satisfaction. But there is the all-new Service Hub from HubSpot, bringing service and support together in one powerful platform so you can deliver the best experiences possible and free up reps' time with an AI-powered help desk. Also, you can keep customers happy. Secrets out. Service Hub is a game changer. Visit HubSpot.com service to learn more. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday, May 28th. I'm John Weigel here with Catherine Laidlaw, and this is The Hustle Daily Show. Hermes is currently facing a lawsuit for denying its bags to people who want to purchase them. The company doesn't just sell to anyone off the street, though. The client has to build a relationship with a sales rep and hope that one day they got offered a bag. Today, we're going to break down why this is, the economics that emerge from it, and how you can play the game just to maybe get that Birkin. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, let's give you the hits and headlines in business and tech. First up, Elon Musk's XAI raised $6 billion in funding. The company, which Musk says was valued at $18 billion before the new investment, will use the money, quote, to take XAI's first products to market, build advanced infrastructure, and accelerate the research and development of future technologies. Next, TSA set a new record on Friday for the most travelers screened in a single day, with over 2.9 million screenings at U.S. checkpoints. Half of the TSA's top 10 busiest days in history have occurred in 2024, so I guess nobody's on that train trend right now. Next, instant messenger service ICQ is officially shutting down on June 26. The service launched in 1996, was purchased by AOL in 1998, and boasted 100 million users in 2001. No longer, though. Over to Apple. Apple is reportedly developing AI-generated emoji with iOS 18, which would allow iPhone users to create custom emoji based on their texts. We're sure everyone will use this feature in a very mature way. And finally, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, and the Garfield movie actually tied with an estimated $31 million domestic take each. The worst Memorial Day opening weekend in about 30 years. Sorry, Garfield. All right, our story today is all about the shiny Birkin bag from Hermes. Catherine, you did a great story on this topic in our Sunday newsletter, and to me it seems rather unnecessarily difficult to buy one of these bags. So first off here, what's the big deal about these Hermes bags? Yeah, so Hermes has been around for centuries now. They started as an equestrian leather goods maker back in France. But what makes the bags themselves special is a few things. The first is the quality. Hermes has been very public about not very many things, but one of the things is that they are adamant that one person works on each bag. That's it from start to finish. There's one artisan, craftsperson. Mm -hmm. Second is the discipline. It's how the company has managed to keep demand for the bags so high by not giving in to supply. And so they really restrict how many bags they put out into the world every year. And three, the patients required to actually get one is pretty noteworthy unless you're willing to spend double or more the retail cost. And we'll get into that. But there's sort of three different things going on that sort of culminate to make the Birkin bag the sort of ultimate in the luxury handbag market. Yeah, it seems like they have run off this joy of exclusivity. You've interviewed a ton of people for this article that you wrote. Can you talk about some of the people that you chatted with and their phases that they were in in the process of buying or not buying a bag? Yeah, so one thing I found interesting was... A number of the women that I talked to, they'd known what Hermes was, but it seemed like maybe a brand for people who were a little bit older. They were all fairly young. Then they got into it by these purse unboxing videos that are really popular on YouTube. And so people will do these 20 minute, 30 minute long stories that accompany them unboxing the purse of their dreams. And so it starts off very aspirational, like, oh, look at this very polished video that I'm watching and look at the excitement being built up and how it feels to open this box and examine this luxuriously crafted piece of art, piece of work. And then slowly, you know, these women sort of went to the boutique. They described feeling intimidated, not quite sure what to wear. And then they sort of get up the confidence to go into the boutique and buy maybe a small item. So one of the women that I spoke to 
bought one of the sort of horse keychains, like classic Rodeo, mm-hmm. as they call, and those, you know, retail for around six hundred dollars. And you don't have to make an appointment to go unless you are visiting the Hermes stores in Paris, the original locations. Mm-hmm. But what's different about the Hermes retail experience, as these women described, was it's not so much that you're going in and sort of browsing around and you're dictating the experience, you go in and immediately a sales rep sort of shows you around the store. What can I help you with? What are you looking for today? It's a very sort of direct to consumer IRL relationship. And so these women sort of start off acquiring smaller pieces. A lot of the time, what they had their eye on from the jump was what's known in the community as a quota bag. And it's called a quota bag because there are usually only sort of one or two quota bag offers that a client in good standing is going to get from the company every year. And quota bags currently are Birkin's Kelly's, which is a slightly different style, but also very popular. And in some regions, a Constance bag. And again, it's just a different style of the bag. And so there's this sort of whole lingo that has developed. And these women described getting sort of more and more into the sort of Hermes <laughs> homies community online. (laughs) They don't sort of self-refer that way, not in conversation at least. So I think it starts off as sort of something to work towards and then gradually over time becomes this relationship that you're emotionally invested in as well as financially. And the brand sort of works to cultivate and then reward that, I think, really successfully. Yeah, it seems that you detail a lot of this process being building that relationship with a specific sales rep at a specific Hermes store that you are in contact with. And to my surprise, it sounds like some of these, if not all of these women, exchange phone numbers with this person and this sales rep texts them about, oh, I just got this in, I just got that in. I think the big elephant in the room here is, are you not able to go into an Hermes store and ask to buy a Birkin bag? (laughs) Or is that just frowned upon by entering a store? So you can certainly ask, but most likely the response you're going to get is, oh, we don't have anything. And what one of the women that I spoke to pointed out was that doesn't mean we don't have anything. It means we don't have anything for you. And so it's not like you can go in and pull the Birkin that you want off the shelf and bring it up to the cash and say, here I am. And here's my (laughs) $20,000. And I'm going to walk out with this bag. It's a much sort of more refined and maybe strategic. I don't want to call it a game, but a game really to get one. And so often they'll have Birkins in the back, but they've already been earmarked for specific clients. And the language even that the sales reps use is very discreet. It's always, oh, I have something for you or I have something you might like. It's not like, oh, your Birkin in this and this came in. Even the language and the interaction is very geared towards building up that emotional connection and anticipation, which I find really fascinating, like right down to even the details of the interaction. Everything is perfectly engineered to amp up your desire. Right. It's incredible sales marketing. Even if you do get that call, they say we have something for you or and they offer you a bag. It may not be the exact one that you want most of the time. They'll just kind of offer you a bag that you casually just have to say yes or no to within a few minutes for a multitude of tens of thousands of dollars. So it is a very interesting game to play, it sounds like. Yes, that's absolutely right. And one thing that I found over and over again in speaking with people who had had this experience was sort of like playing grateful and being demure and sort of carrying yourself with a quiet elegance goes a really long way. And then I would sort of have to step back and think, wait, this is a business transaction. Like you're playing grateful that they're letting you spend five figures on a purse that isn't the one that you asked for. Like there's something so incongruous to me about that. And the psychological gymnastics at play are so fascinating. And I found that as I was reporting it out, like I could feel it working on me and I am not a fancy person. I wouldn't have an occasion to carry a Birkin bag. I think in any circumstance in my life, they don't sell them online, but there are many offshoot resale sites that sell them. And I would see one for $11,000 and think, oh, that's actually a really good deal because a lot of the other ones will sort of go for $30,000 and up. And I would sort of think, well, $11,000, like Maybe, you know, that's really nice. Like, maybe I would want that. And then I would stop and think like, what? (laughs) 
<laughs> like I what think, am I doing? Yeah, <laughs> it really felt like going through the looking glass a little bit. I'm not even into luxury in the same way, but in a strange way, I can really see the appeal mm -hmm. and why the idea of making an investment that's also a symbol that for a lot of these people of how hard they've worked or an accomplishment they've been able to achieve, you know, why having that hanging on your arm and also acting as an investment would be really appealing. Let's talk about that nature of investment. Once you do buy a Birkin bag, and assuming that you either get it from the Hermes boutique or you purchase it through a second or third party, however you acquire the Hermes bag, this thing will retain its value, right? It will become more expensive over the years and it is seemingly a very viable investment. So one consignment platform actually did a really interesting study a few years ago about this and compared the average annual return of a Birkin bag to the S&P 500 and to gold because it was sort of one of these things that had become lore, like that the bag would hold its value and that it was a good investment and they wanted to see if that bore truth. And what they came up with was from 1980 to 2015, on average, the S&P 500 annual nominal return was 11.6% and gold's was 1.9%. The Birkin bag was 14.2%. So, I mean, the numbers bear that out. That said, one thing the company is extremely vigilant about is sussing out resellers. The house of cards only stays up if they can limit supply, right? Mm -hmm. And keep that demand as high as humanly possible. And so if they get even a whiff that you are reselling or if they know that you've bought a really specialized bag or if you post a Facebook ad to try and sell your Birkin under your own name, people have reported getting cease and desist letters from the company, getting notes saying that they have violated the terms of sale agreement. A very well-known Hermes reseller who wrote a book about this was blacklisted and had to shut his business down. And so the company takes it really, really seriously. It sounds like it. The company takes seriously a lot of things from point of sale to giving you this bag to, I guess, entrusting you with their brand that they hold in such high regard. So there is a lawsuit against Hermes right now. It's an antitrust lawsuit. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes. Back in March, two California customers filed a lawsuit against the company. It's a proposed class action suit. It hasn't yet been certified, but it alleges that the company engages in a practice called tying. And what tying means is the company requires customers to buy other items before they've spent enough to earn, in this instance, a Birkin. And so it's sort of tying the value of smaller items to a bigger ticket item that a customer actually wants. Hermes' practice has long been criticized among its more impatient customers. Customers. customers in China have even protested the practice. And there are sort of endless forums that you can go onto that speculate on how much pre-spend is required to get what they call the call. There are influencer videos online of people screaming, crying, and, you know, shrieking. People get really emotional about it. But the crux of this lawsuit is that two California customers wanted to buy Birkin bags and couldn't. And they saw that as Hermes having unlawful monopoly over Birkin bags. And the experts that I spoke to didn't think that the lawsuit had legs. And there were two reasons for that. One is that it's remarkably hard to prove tying. And the company has been over the years extremely careful about the language that they use. Mm -hmm. Also, there are rampant exceptions to this rule. You see videos online of people having these experiences of walking in one day and actually getting the sort of coveted Kelly bag from the back without having a purchase history. And that sort of keeps the playbook unpredictable in a way that I think the company also needs. And then the other thing that I find makes the lawsuit sort of additionally unlikely is that one of the plaintiffs actually already owns a Birkin bag. And so, <laughs> you know, it's like undercutting your credibility a little bit to be like, well, I just wanted another one. And that was hard for me to get. Or I wanted to buy one directly from the boutique rather than buy from a reseller, which honestly, if you wanted a Birkin bag tomorrow, you could go online, the real real, or there's all these consignment shops. Yes, you'll pay a premium for it, sometimes as much as 300%. Right. But if you really wanted the bag, like Victoria Beckham, for example, has a huge Birkin collection, apparently one of the biggest in the world. And certainly she's not buying those all from the store. They are out there. It is possible. It's a matter of whether you want to spend the time or the money, but you're going to spend one of those two things. 
well, I am not a candidate to spend the time or the money. But the thing that I want to end with is that controversial, yes, but Hermes has stayed on top of the luxury brands. A lot of luxury brands have experienced some fallout in recent years. They've stayed on top and it's likely for this reason. Yeah. The experts that I spoke to, in addition to sort of not thinking the lawsuit had much promise, said that the company was really unique in the world for how disciplined they've been about this. And as a result, how staunchly they've been able to hold that position at the apex of the luxury market, which is a really coveted spot. Hermes has become an expert in selling not just handbags, but a true spiritual experience to its customers. And thank you so much for blowing my mind today. (laughs) All right. And that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning into the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig. And our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, sign on up at thehustle.co slash email, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, everybody. I got a great podcast to tell you about. It's called Truth, Lies, and Work. And it's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. On this show, you can join husband and wife team Alan, Leanne, Elliot as they dispel myths, impart wisdom, and answer all your questions about finding, keeping, and motivating great people. They actually just did an episode with John Smith, who is the manager and agent of famous Argentinian soccer player Diego Maradona. He talks about in this episode how he was able to manage the global superstar athlete celebrity that Maradona is and was. It's a great listen. You better get out there and check it out. And you can listen to Truth, Lies, and Work wherever you get your podcasts.